Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ages of Empires, where we will be going through all the major world empires throughout history. In this episode, we will be covering the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom and the Xiongnu Confederation. These are perhaps two empires that I did not know much about going into, so and that's the case for you too. I hope you enjoy. I think one of the key benefits of this series is that we're dedicating about a similar amount of time to each empire because although these may not be the most famous empires or the most commonplace empires that everyone knows about, they nonetheless during their times or during for the people who lived within them, they were everything to these people. So they're very important to study and also it gives us a better picture as we progress into other empires and as we consider retroactively some of the previous empires that we have covered, we can learn more details about them as well. As well, in the style of Plutarch's Parallel Lives, we will distill a leader from each respective empire. In this episode, we will have Demetrius I of the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom and Modu Chenyu of the Xiongnu Confederation. At the very end of the episode, we will also have a comparison between the two leaders to learn a little, a little bit more about the two their respective empires, in the style, and, and this will be done in the style of Plutarch's Parallel Lives. In my previous series on ancient Greek and Roman history, Plutarch, one of my favorite authors, maybe the most influential author in my life, he takes leaders from ancient Greece and ancient Rome, and then at the end he would have comparisons between the two to learn a little bit more about them, so that's the inspiration behind that. So without further ado, we will begin with the first empire, and then we will consider to the first the leader of that empire, then we will have the second empire, and then the second leader, and then the comparison. So pardon me, now without further ado, we will begin. So the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom. The Greco-Bactrian Kingdom was a Hellenistic state, Hellenistic state that emerged in the wake of Alexander the Great's conquests. It existed in the eastern part of the former Persian Empire, and was characterized by a fusion of Greek and Persian cultural elements. Therefore, we will seek to find a detailed account of its rise and fall. So we have covered the Achaemenid Empire, or the first Persian Empire, so we can, can, we can make comparisons there, and as well we've also covered the Macedonian Empire too, so this is sort of one of the descending states. Amongst, we've also covered the Seleucid Empire for example, and we've also called, covered the Ptolemaic Empire as well. So these are all descendant states of the Alexandrian Empire or the Macedonian Empire. So starting with the rise of the Greco-Bactrian Empire, Alexander's conquests in the 4th century BCE. After Alexander the Great's conquests of the Persian Empire, 334 to 323 BCE, his vast empire was divided amongst his generals. Seleucus I, Nicator, became the ruler of the eastern part, known as the Seleucid Empire, which included Bactria, modern-day northern Afghanistan and parts of Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. So after the fall of, ancient, of Alexander the Great's empire, the Greco-Bactrian Empire was for a time under the Seleucid Empire, the rule of Seleucus uh, I, Nicator, and we have covered the Seleucid Empire, and I hope you have or will endeavor to check it out. Diodotus and the Declaration of Independence in 256 BCE. Diodotus I, a local satrap under Seleucus, declared independence from the Seleucid Empire in this year, 256 BCE, and established the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom around this time. This marked the official beginning of the Greco-Bactrian Empire. So, to sort of think of it visually, Seleucus I, sort of, was one of the satraps under the Alexandrian, or one of the generals of Alexander the Great, developed the Seleucid Empire, and then Diodotus I was one of his satraps, and then formed, uh, established independence, forming the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom around 256 BCE. As for expansion and zenith, Euthydemus and Demetrius in the late 3rd century BCE. Euthydemus I, a general of Diodotus, successfully defended Bactria against the invasion of the Seleucid ruler, Antiochus III. His son, Demetrius I, expanded the empire's territory by conquering parts of India, including the Punjab region. 
As for cultural synthesis, the Greek of Bactrian Empire was characterized by a unique blend of Greek and indigenous Persian and Bactrian cultures. Greek was the official language and Hellenistic cultural elements coexisted with local traditions. So sort of this, still this legacy of Alexander the Great, the Greek influence is still there, despite having indigenous uh, peoples from both Persia and Bactria itself. As for challenges and decline, it started with internal conflicts. It was not too, despite its power and despite the size of it, it was um, not too long of an existence. Starting with internal conflicts. The empire faced internal conflicts, often, res often related to struggles for power among rival claimants to the throne. These disputes weakened the central authority. So as we've seen, almost all the empires to date, at least of these ancient empires, there was a lot of lack of centralization or loss of central authority that led to their collapse. But as well, there's always external pressures, such as pressures from the north in the second century BCE. The nomadic Zhang Nu, who we will cover, and Sakas exerted pressure on the northern boundaries of the empire. So it's a very fascinating episode where the two empires here that we will be covering um, coexisted and battled each other even. This further strained the resources and stability of the greek bactrian state. So something that I've tried to elucidate throughout many of these empires is that sort of the, both the internal issues and the external issues sort of feed into each other and reinforce each other. So it's not just the internal issues that cause most of these empires to decline, or not just the external forces that cause empires to decline, but weakened internal forces allow the external forces to become more threatening, or vice versa. As for the Mauryan Empire, so we covered the Mauryan Empire was part of the Magadha, was one of the dynasties that ruled over Magadha, which is an episode we have also covered in ancient Indian history and their expansion in the second century BCE. The Indian Mauryan Empire under Ashoka, who we have also covered uh, somewhat, so many, most throughout most of history, he was considered to be a good person, but recent scholars have said he was not a good person, so I chose to give him the benefit of the doubt, but I appreciate those who have um, the other alternative opinions. And Ashoka began to expand westward, threatening the Greco-Bactrian kingdom, encroaching on the Greco-Bactrian territories in northern India. As for Eucrates, the first um, who lived from 172 to 145 BCE, he was one of the most important Greco-Bactrian kings. Eucrates overthrew the Euthyramid dynasty. So the Greco-Bactrian kingdom was, was ruled by both the Diodotid and the Euthydemid dynasties. And Eucrates I was one who restored the Diodotid dynasty. So these two dynasties rivaled for the power of Greco-Bactria and restored the Diodotus to power. Interestingly, Eucrates was Eucratides. The name so sounds more similar to Euthydemid, but he's from the Diodotid, so important to note. He fought against the easternmost Hellenistic and Indian rulers in India, most no notably the Mauryan Empire of Magadha. Holding territory in the Indus and as far as Baragaza, Bari Gaza, until he was finally defeated by Meander and pushed back to Bactria. So they expanded once more under his rule. Eucratides minted a vast and prestigious coinage, which we will cover, suggesting a rule of considerable importance and prosperity. It's often considered one of the largest, many of the cities were the largest and richest cities in antiquity. And his coin maybe is the most significant coin in history, as we shall see. His son, Heo Heliocles I, was the last Greek king to rule in Bactria, as the UAZ overran the country in 120 BCE. As for the end of the empire, the fall of the capital in 140 BCE, the Greek Bactria Bactrian capital on the Oxus, modern-day Akanuom, but it was actually called Alexandria. Many cities were named Alexandria, but it's better to call it Akanuom to differentiate it, because that was also the name, um, the later name, fell to a combined force of local nomads and possibly invading Indo-Scythians. We've also covered the Scythians. This event marked a significant blow to the empire. 
as for fragmentation in successor states. Following the fall of Icanuum on the Oxus, the Greco-Bactrian Empire fragmented into smaller semi-autonomous kingdoms. Some of these states continued to exist for several decades. I think it's sort of foreshadowing that originally it found independence from the Seleucid Empire. To believe that no other independence would happen is sort of something to be wondered. As for final disintegration, the 1st century BCE, by the 1st century BCE, the last remnants of the Greco-Bactrian Empire were absorbed or replaced by various regional powers, including the Indo-Parthians and the Kushans. We shall discuss both of those empires in more detail in future episodes, which I hope you endeavor and will check out. Endeavor 2. As for legacy, the Greco-Bactrian Empire's legacy lies in its role in, as a bridge between the Hellenistic and Indian cultures, influencing art, coinage, and cultural exchange in the region. It also left a lasting mark on Central Asian history and the development of the Silk Road trade routes. So very important in terms of establishing those early trade routes. The exact dates and the events of the Greco-Bactrian Empire are not always well documented. It must be noted, so my apologies if some of the dates are... Uh, may vary somewhat, and there may be variations in historical accounts. Therefore, we have sought to provide a general narrative based on the variable historical sources. Now we will discuss a particular leader, a very important leader, Demetrius I. The most, perhaps, important leader of the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom was Demetrius I, also known as Demetrius Anikitos, the Invincible. He ruled from approximately 200 BCE to 180 BCE and played a pivotal role in the expansion and consolidation of the kingdom's territories. Demetrius I was born around 215 BCE, likely in Bactria, modern-day northern Afghanistan. He was a member of the Seleucid royal family, which ruled over a large part of Alexander the Great's former empire. But he was living in Greco-Bactria, not in Seleucid the Seleucid Empire. Demetrius initially served as a military commander under the Seleucid king Antiochus III during his campaign against the rebel satraps in the eastern provinces. In 209 BCE, Demetrius saw an opportunity to assert his own power and declared independence from the Seleucid Empire. Establishing himself as a ruler of Bactria, this marked the beginning of his reign as the first independent Greco-Bactrian king. So he was the founder of the Greco-Bactrian kingdom. And to confirm, at the time of his birth, he was within the Seleucid royal family and within Seleucid territory. But he claimed independence, maybe kind of somewhat of a Washington figure. That's George Washington of the United States. One of Demetrius' most significant achievements was a successful defense of Greco-Bactrian Greco kingdom against the invasion of the Seleucid king Antiochus III. In the Battle of Arius in 208 BCE, this victory not only secured the kingdom's independence, but also established Demetrius as a formidable leader. Demetrius I was an ambitious ruler who sought to expand his kingdom's territory. He undertook military campaigns both westward into the Iranian plateau and southward into the Indian South Con subcontinent. His campaigns in India were particularly successful and he captured significant portions of the Mauryan Empire, also covered in the Magadha. The Mauryan dynasty was one of the ruling dynasties of Magadha, establishing the Greco-Bactrian presence in northern India. During his reign, Demetrius I also undertook extensive urbanization efforts, founding several cities and fortresses in the newly acquired territories. Among these, he established a new city named Demetrias, modern-day Jalabad in Afghanistan, which serves as a testament to his political and cultural ambitions. And pardon me that some of the dates are confusing, so, uh, but nonetheless, he, he was the, I, I, I know, one of the sources I found said he was born in 250 BCE, and that wouldn't make sense if the empire was founded in 256 BCE, so my apologies that the dates may differ, but the point was he was perhaps born uh, earlier or later, but nonetheless he was the founder of the Greco-Bactrian kingdom, so just to con confirm that. Demetrius I's rule was characterized by a blend of Greek and local Central Asian and Indian cultures. He likely employed Greek as the language of administration and the elite, which allowed 
which while allowing the continuation of various local languages spoken by the majority of the population, so somewhat of a tolerance for other minority languages, especially in such a multicultural and multi-religious kingdom. Therefore, one of the definitions, supposedly, of an empire is that it must include multiple different peoples, and therefore this would qualify as an empire. Despite his military successes and territorial expansion, Demetrius' reign was not without challenges. He faced internal opposition and power struggles. And the kingdom's border regions were susceptible to nomadic incursions. Demetrius I died around 180 BCE, and his successors continued to rule the Greco-Bactrian kingdom for several more decades. However, the kingdoms eventually succumbed to external pressures, including the incursions of nomadic tribes and internal conflicts, leading to its eventual decline and fall. Demetrius I's legacy as a dynamic and ambitious ruler who expanded the Greco-Bactrian kingdom's territories and established a unique cultural and political pressure presence in Central Asia and Northern India remains a testament to the complexity and dynamist, dynamism of the Hellenistic world. So think of such a, an amazing feat after the fall of Alexander the Great, there was much so much division amongst these people, but to for someone to break off from the Seleucid Empire and then to unite many different groups of different people of different languages and different cultures is quite an amazing feat. Now we will move to the content of the slide. So, the title, Demetrius I and the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom, ruled by the Diodoted and Euthydemid dynasties. So the two dynasties that ruled over it, and they were rival dynasties even for power over this empire. And it was among the largest and richest cities in antiquity, or many of the cities within the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom were considered the largest, as we shall see evidence of that coming up. Significant leader, Demetrius I, Empire Greco-Bactria, period 256 to 120 BCE, modern location, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and parts of Iran and Pakistan. Million square kilometers, 2.5 million square miles, 0.97 percent of the world, 1.86. So despite being less well known, it's actually one of the larger empires that we have covered, even larger than many of the Egyptian or almost all of the Egyptian empires. As for capital city, it was Bactria, which is also named the Lound of a Thousand Golden Cities, which is clear evidence of their wealth, and I Canuum, which was also called for Alexandria on the Oxus. Government, monarchy, or two dynasties, namely. Common language, Koine Greek, which was the official language from showing its legacy from the Macedonians or Alexander the Great. Bactrian, Sodian, and Parthian. Religion, Hellenism, Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and ancient Iranian religion. Population, hundreds of thousands. Now, the images in the top left, we have a coin with Demetrius I on it. To the right, we have what's called a Corinthian capital, which is the top of a column, which was found in I Canuum in the second, and supposedly created in the second century BCE, so showing sort of some of the Greco roots, the Greek roots in terms of architecture. To the right, we have on, on the coin, this is Demetrius the first tyrant, trident of, Gor, of Gorgon, which is a on a coin. So supposedly Demetrius had a trident, and for some reason, I don't know where it came. Maybe I was young, but I always associated the name Demetrius with water for some reason. I'm not sure why. To the right, maybe the most evidence of wealth is the famous gold 20 stator of Eucratides, the one who restored the Diodotid dynasty in the Greco-Bactrian kingdom, in the clash between the Diodotids and Euthydemid dynasties. It's the largest coin in antiquity. It's 169.2 grams. Um, so very, very heavy, almost 16% of, or just no, nonetheless, 169.2 grams, or yeah, 16.9% of a kilogram was what I was uh, trying to say. 16, yeah, about 17% of a kilogram. Um, diameter is 58 millimeters, so almost about half a centimeter. So massive coin, largest coin in antiquity. If someday I ever um, get to start building my own collection of ancient artifacts, I'd like to own this coin, if not just because it's a great piece of gold, but also it's a very fascinating leader, and it's, I think it's an empire that few people know about, so sort of a dear object. I'm not 
too materialistic, but every once in a while I find something I'm like, ooh, I would really like to own that. But uh, whoever has that, or I'm not sure which museum it's in, but nonetheless, very fascinating thing. And there's an image, which we can see, of Eucratides, and you can see he's got quite modern looking features and quite a modern looking helmet, even in this time in the BCE, before Common Era period. Below that, we have a bronze Hercules statuette found in I Canuum, so still showing once again their Greek roots. Hercules, very famous hero of ancient Greece. To the right, we have a Greek of Buddhist representation of Gautama Buddha from the first or second century AD, so showing some of their uh, Indian influences that also uh, were prominent in the region in the later years as the Mauryan Empire from Magadha started to encroach and even rule over the Greco-Bactrian kingdom's previous territories. And above that we have the coin of Demetrius with an elephant and uh, as well as a god. I saw this one article that pointed out that the elephants were seen as equal to kings because kings were usually on coins but also gods were usually on coins so they made the deduction that elephants, gods, and kings were all of equal standard. So um, maybe that's heightening the value of elephants, maybe decreasing the value of gods and sort of putting them all at the level of kings, but I think it's just an interesting way to observe their culture and also their appreciation for the elephant, which is today at least the largest land animal. Below that and to the right we have the UAZ who ultimately were the ones to, to encroach upon their territory and led to large part of their defeat. So they came from Zhang, close uh, a little around Zhongnu, whom we will cover, and they moved to Wusan, down to Taiyuan, to Bactria, and down to India. So that movement, interesting, I wonder why it was they did that, and maybe as we'll cover them, we'll figure that out. But nonetheless, they were one of the key causes of the defeat of the greco bactrian kingdom, and they came from ancient China, and moved ultimately to ancient India, so perhaps their descendants are still there. And ab above that, we have there, so they were preceded by the Seleucid Empire after a war of war after gaining their independence, sort of in the style of George Washington, succeeded by the Indo-Greek Kingdom, whom we will cover, the Parthian Empire, and the Kushan Empire, we will likely cover all three of them, if not directly, or in part. And above that we have the map of the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom, absolutely massive, 2.5 million square kilometers, from all the way bridging, bordering the Seleucid Empire, the Parthian Kingdom, the Mauryan Empire of Magadha, as well as Pamir, and the bridging on the Himalayas, Scythia, all the way to the Caspian Sea. So absolutely massive land and very impressive that they were able to hold it for so long, even though it wasn't for a particularly long period, but still for that length, considering the power of all the, the empires, their neighboring empires, and sort of because its establishment wasn't quite that secure, it was very, very fascinating. So that is Demetrius I in the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom, and we'll discuss Demetrius a bit more as in a comparison at the end. So the Xiongnu Empire. The Xiongnu, or the Xiongnu Confederation, often called, also known as the Xiongnu Confederation, was a powerful nomadic confederation that emerged in the eastern Eurasian steppes around the 3rd century BCE. It played a significant role in the, ancient, in the history of ancient China and the surrounding regions. Therefore, we seek to find a detailed account of its rise and fall. So the rise of Xiongnu. So just to note, we've covered some of the previous dynasties of ancient China. We've covered the, the Xia, for example, the Zhang, for example, and uh, we will cover more. But this is different. This is not necessarily a dynasty. This is a confederation of states. And it's not necessarily just in China, as we can see it expands to vast quantities of territory, probably most prominently Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Siberia, and lattermost China. But nonetheless, uh, we will continue. The prim primary language was uh, was Yenizen, Old Turkish, and Old Chinese. So they're often considered a, a history of ancient China, but they also sort of spread on a huge area of land. So starting with the rise of Xiongnu, with the origins and oily conflict in the 3rd century BCE, the Xiongnu are believed to have originated in the region of China's north of China's Great Wall. So perhaps even the Great Wall was built in part to keep out these such peoples. They were a confederation of various nomadic tribes that coalesced under a single leadership, 
likely under the chieftain named Modu Chan Yu, who we will discuss in specifically. I think of him as even a, somewhat of a Genghis Khan-like figure, long before Genghis Khan himself. Modu Chen Yu's reforms in 209 to 174 BCE. Modu Chen Yu is credited with centralizing the Xiongnu Confederation and implementing military reforms, which significantly increased their military capabilities. He introduced new strategies, tactics, and organization to their cavalry, cavalry making them a formidable force. So they were nomadic people, so they relied heavily on their cavalry. As for the conflicts with the Han Dynasty from the 3rd to 2nd century BCE, the Xiongnu's expansion brought them into conflict with the Han Dynasty of China. The Han Emperor Wu launched several campaigns against the Xiongnu in an attempt to secure the northern borders and to protect the Chinese heartland. I always find, or I say maybe wrongly so, that the ancient Chinese dynasties were somewhat uh, hyper-conservative in that they built a wall to keep people out. They were not like many of the other empires that just ceaselessly wanted to expand building the, a wall as a sign of conservatism. And they also maybe um, uh, just a hypothesis, I think, to move east is sort of chasing the sun is there's something conservative it, up about it. Whereas one moves left, the days get longer as they're sort of sleeping in and sort of quite more of a liberal thing. So just a hypothesis, but also across most states, the West tends to be more liberal and the East tends to be more conservative, but just a hypothesis, but nonetheless, conti continuing that they built the Great Wall to keep out these nomadic peoples, many of which became part of the Xiongnu Confederation under the Modu Chenyu. The height of Xiongnu power in the 2nd century BCE, the, after the peaceful period, known as the peaceful period, from 133 to 89 BCE, after a prolonged period of warfare, a treaty known as the Peace of Shan Yu was signed in 133 BCE between Xiongnu and the Han Dynasty. This treaty established a period of relative peace, allowing for increased trade and cultural exchange between the two powers. But moving to the decline and fall of the Xiongnu Empire, but quickly to speak of that peace treaty is the fact that the Han Dynasty, which was maybe one of the most powerful imperial Chinese dynasties, at least up until this time. It was considered the second one to be officially of an imperial dynasty, or but some dispute when it actually became imperial, but nonetheless, one of the earliest imperial dynasties. The fact that they were felt so threatened by Xiongnu, or that they would rather have peace rather than continued war, shows to the strength of the Xiongnu confederation or empire. But as for the decline and fall of the Xiongnu Empire, the internal conflicts and civil war in the first century BCE. Following the death of the strong Xiongnu leader, Huan Hu Hanzi Shan Yu, in 60 BCE, internal power struggles and succession disputes weakened the confederation. This led to civil war between different factions. As for northern and southern Xiongnu in the 1st century BCE, so the civil war between the north and the south, the civil war resulted in a split between the Xiongnu confederation. The northern Xiongnu remained in the traditional ter territories of northern China, while the southern Xiongnu, also known as southern Xiongnu kingdom, established a separate polity in the northern part of modern-day China. As for Chinese encroachments and fragmentation in the 1st to 2nd century CE, common era or Christian era, the weakened Xiongnu confederation faced increased pressure from the expanding Han dynasty, which gradually encroached on their territory. Additionally, internal divisions and external pressures from the nomadic from other nomadic groups further fragmented the Xiongnu. As for the fall of the northern Xiongnu Empire in the second century CE, by the 2nd century CE, the northern Xiongnu were largely absorbed and displaced by various nomadic groups such as Xianbei and Xiongnu remnants, and furthermore, Chinese expansion as well. The Xiongnu as a major political entity ceased to exist in this time. As for the legacy, despite their ultimate decline, elements of Xiongnu culture and society continued to influence subsequent steppe peoples and neighboring sedentary civilizations. That people are people who live the nomadic regions of sort of Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Siberia, 
and also um, settled states as well, or sedentary civilizations. Some Xiongnu groups may have assimilated into other nomadic confederations as well. The Xiongnu's empire's rise and fall marked a crucial period in the history of Inner Asia and the interactions with the Chinese civilizations. The Xiongnu's military prowess and diplomatic exchanges with the Han Dynasty left a lasting impact on geopolitics and cultural, the cultural landscape of the region. It's a very important empire, one that I knew very little about, but it really sort of clears up a lot of questions I had or uh, uh, sort of blank areas that I had. So, for example, like why, why did the Han Dynasty and why did so many people in ancient China feel threatened by the North, especially considering that they were just nomadic people, non-sedentary civilizations? Well, there were things such as the Xiongnu Confederation, which were um, amalgamated many massive area of land, as we shall see, percent of the world is one of the, it's in fact even the largest we've even seen to date, and they were severely threatening, and hence the, largely the creation of the Great Wall of China. So as for a specific life of Modu Chenyu, the most important leader of the Xiongnu Empire, perhaps, was Modu Chenyu also known as Mao Dun or Mo Dun. He reigned during a critical period in the empire's history and played a central role in its rise to prominence. As for his early life and rise to power, Mo Du Chen Yu was born around 234 BCE, during a time when the Xiongnu were a collection of loosely affiliated nomadic tribes in the eastern Eurasian steppes. So the region was even smaller, the eastern Eurasian steppes, many different groups as well. In his youth, Modu witnessed the internal conflicts and disunity among the Xiongnu tribes, which left them vulnerable to external threats. Recognizing the need for unified leadership, Modu Chen Yu began a campaign to consolidate the various tribes under his rule. The, a combination of military conquests and diplomatic maneuvers, he gradually established his authority. So I said, sort of, sort of like a Genghis Khan figure but long before Genghis Khan in uniting many tribes. There was a great book by um, uh, that a good friend of mine that gave to me when I was uh, younger, I guess in grade school, called Wolf of the Plains. It was sort of very nice, well-written history of the life of Genghis Khan and sort of his difficult upbringing and then to his climb to be such a powerful leader over many uh, nomadic tribes and peoples. And I think there's in many ways many parallels, and maybe Modu Chenyu was sort of maybe even an influence for, for Genghis Khan, if not directly through other people. For example, the next nomadic leader who united many tribes was probably inspired by Modu Chenyu, the next and the next and the next and the next, and then ultimately Genghis Khan would have been in, directly influenced by a leader such as Modu Chenyu. Recognizing the need for unified leadership, Modu Chen Yu began a campaign to consolidate various Xiongnu tribes under his rule, and through a combination of military conquests and diplomatic maneuvers, he gradually established his authority. As for his military reforms and expansion, Modu Chen Yu implemented a significant military reforms, which transformed the Xiongnu into a highly organized and formidable fighting force. He introduced new tactics, weaponry, and cavalry formations that gave the Xiongnu a distinct advantage on the battlefield. So it wasn't sufficient just to unite them. He also improved them. With his strengthened military, Modu Shan Yu launched campaigns of territorial expansion, seizing control of vast stretches of territory, as we shall see, in the eastern Eurasian steppes. His conquests extended from the Altai Mountains to, in the west to the Korean Peninsula in the east. So massive area of land. As for his conflict with the Han Dynasty, Modu Chen Yu's territorial expansion brought the Xiongnu into direct conflict with the Han Dynasty as he expanded into the Korean Peninsula, for example, all the way to the full to the east. With the Han Dynasty of China, which sought to secure its northern borders. So they had already had fear of the the nomadic tribes to the north and had already been building this wall for many, uh, for hundreds of years, in fact. But um, and after they were united under Modu Chen Yu and moving closer, the threat became more significant. The ensuing conflict led to a series of campaigns known as the Zhan Nu Han, Han Wars. Modu Chen Yu faced several Han emperors, including Emperor Wu, who launched a significant military expeditions to try to subdue the Zhan Nu. We will cover this empire soon, and this is a very important battle between 
the fact that Modu Shanyu faced emperors such as Emperor Wu is very significant to great leaders going head to head. As for legacy and achievements, Modu Shanyu's reign marked a pivotal turning point in the Xiongnu history. Under his leadership, the loosely organized tribes were unified into a powerful and centralized empire. His military reforms and strategic acumen made the Xiongnu a formidable force in the region. The tactics he introduced became influential and were adopted by, by subsequent steppe empires. Modu Shanyu's diplomatic skills were also notable. He skillfully negotiated treaties and alliances, including the Peace of Shanyu with the Han Dynasty, which brought a period of relative stability and expanded trade between the two powers. So not only great in battle, not only great in uniting tribes through force, through the carrot or the stick, through, through uh, temptation or uh, through uh, uh, the alternative, um, he also was great at forming peace alliances too, and maybe peace through strength. As for his later years in succession, Modu Shanyu's exact date of death is not well documented, but it is believed to have occurred around 174 BCE. He was succeeded by his son, Ji Yu Shanyu, who continued his father's policies and further expanded the Xiongnu Empire. Modu Shanyu's leadership and accomplishments were instrumental in the establishment of the Xiongnu Empire as a major force in ancient Eurasia. His legacy endured through the empire's subsequent history and left a lasting impact on the nomadic cultures of the region. So very, very fascinating leader. I did not know, to, I did not even know about before uh, embarking on this journey. So I was grateful to learn about him, and I hope you uh, found this fascinating as well. So as for the content of the slide title, we have Modu Shanyu and the Xiongnu Confederation, a tribal confederation empire founded by Modu Shanyu. It was considered one of the four barbarians that uh, threatened ancient China. Significant leader, Modu Shanyu, period, Zhang, or pardon me, empire, Xiongnu, period, circa 300 BCE to 100 CE. Modern location, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Siberia, and China. Million square kilometers, 9. Million square miles, 3.47% of the world, 6.68%, that's excluding Antarctica. This, in fact, makes it the largest empire at its greatest extent that we have covered. So that is larger than the AK Minute Empire, larger than the Macedonian Empire at its peak under Alexander the Great. It is the largest, but it must be noted they were nomadic, not necessarily sedentary people, sort of just uh, moving over this vast swath of territory, and it maybe would have been less contested than, per se, some of those, um, perhaps in Mesopotamia, whereas, so, but nonetheless, still larger. But what, what I'm saying is that some of the, to claim, like, a million square kilometers, necessarily, in Mesopotamia, for example, might be a little bit more difficult than to claim a million square kilometers in Mongolia, perhaps, just throwing that out there, but nonetheless, the number speaks for itself. It is the largest we have covered so far. As for capital, Longchang, which is Mongolian loot, meaning dragon city. So they, um, they re I revered the dragon. I went to Cardiff in Wales, and apparently this was uh, there was a vexillogist who was an expert of, of flags. And supposedly the Welsh flag, supposedly the Welsh believe they have roots maybe dating back from the ancient east so even the, there's this ancient eastern connection to dragons that supposedly made it all the way over to Wales into the Celts or well the Celtic people of the Welsh Celtic people and supposedly they because the Prince of Wales becomes King of England after the death of or King Queen of England after the death so nonetheless they believe there's sort of eastern blood in ruling over the United Kingdom. Government, a tribal confederation. Common languages, Yenisian, Old Turkish, and Old Chinese. Religion, shamanism, and tengrism. Population, hundreds of thousands to millions. As for images, in the top left, we have an image of Modu Chanyu, featured actually in a Genghis Khan museum, showing that sort of similar legacy that they both have, but Modu Shanyu was a long period before. To the right, we have a helmet, which would have been, or crown, of one of their leaders, with a bird on top. To the right of that, we have a belt buckle featuring a horse, and I believe it's 
um, I believe it's trampling some individual or some uh, something. So, but they very much revere horses, as we can see many of the images on the slide, which we will further continue to show the reverence for horses and being a nomadic people and being dependent on it for their military prowess. It makes certain sense. Below that, we have a garment that they would have worn. So amazing that it lasted this long. Below that, we also have a silk, um, or I don't know if it's necessarily silk, or, but uh, nonetheless, uh, material showing much of their intricate walk artwork. I'm actually pretty certain it's not silk, but showing some of their intricate sewing abilities. To the right, we have a seal that is showing one of their leaders showing allegiance to the Hans, which is, and it's written in old Chinese, so sort of starting to show when the Hans started to become more powerful and started to exert more force. To the right, we have a big statue of a horse, and it's trampling a person. It's hard to maybe see, but this is a head, actually. It's showing the horse trampling, so not only was the horse beloved perhaps by them but it was also seen definitively as a tool for warfare and up to, into the left we have another horse on a belt buckle once again trampling someone it looks like and above that we have a map of the extant of the land in 150 bce showing the massive swath of land of course as we know the globes are expanded on the top portion but still 9 million square kilometers or 3.47 million square miles is the largest empire pardon me we have covered to date so now into a comparison between Demetrius I of the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom and Modu Shanyu of the Xiongnu Confederation. Demetrius I of the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom and Modu Shanyu of the Xiongnu uh, 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 Confederation were both significant leaders in their respective empires during the same general period in ancient history. Important to note, despite their different backgrounds and cultural context, they shared some similarities while also present, possessing distinct characteristics. As for their background and origins, Demetrius I was a member of the Seleucid royal family and originally served as a military commander under the Seleucid Empire before declaring independence and establishing the Greco-Bactrian Kingdom. So he was a member of the royal family, but he sort of broke off. I guess maybe he wasn't heir to the throne, otherwise he would have been the king of Seleucid, Seleucid Empire. So he sort of broke off from his family to establish it, but he was one of the, the more powerful people of that empire. He hailed from a Hellenistic Greek background, which, with, and with his rule reflecting the cultural and political influences of the Hellenistic rule, world, hence it's the Greco-Bactrian kingdom, even though it covered a wide variety of different cultures, languages, and religions, it was predominantly Greek, hailing from the legacy of the Seleucid. Seleucus was one of the satraps, or one, pardon me, one of the generals under Alexander the Great. As for Modu Shen Yu, Modu Shanyu emerged from Zhongnu as a confederation of nomadic tribes in the eastern Eurasian steppes. He played a pivotal role in unifying this and centralizing the tribes under his rule. Modu Shanyu's background was rooted in the nomadic traditions of the steppe, and his leadership style reflected the pragmatism and adaptability of steppe cultures. So he was likely a chieftain of one of the uh, nomadic tribes, or at least became a leader of one of the nomadic tribes, but he united them all. So sort of a different background, whereas Demetrius I was a story of independence, whereas Modu Shen Yu is a story of unification, almost the opposites. One is the story of sort of separation, and one is the story of uniting. But nonetheless, after Demetrius I separated, he did unite regions and conquer regions, but Modu Shen Yu was sort of straight in terms of conquer and expand and unite. As for military leadership and achievements, Demetrius I was a skilled military leader who successfully defended the Greco-Bactrian kingdom against the invasion of the Seleucid king Antiochus III. His victory at the Battle of Arius solidified the kingdom's independence. He expanded the kingdom's territory, particularly in northern India, capturing territories that were part of the Mauryan Empire, or Magadha, as we covered in an episode I hope you endeavor to check out. As for Modu Chanyu, Modu Chanyu is renowned for his military reforms and strategic brilliance. He has transformed the Zhongnu into a highly organized and powerful fighting force. Through his military conquests, Modu Chanyu expanded the Zhongnu's empire, territory, exerting control over vast stretches of the eastern Eurasian steppes. Maybe by effect, maybe the Great Wall of China was in part continued to be built because of his threats. Maybe if there was no Modu Shanyu, maybe they would have never thought to continue building the Great Wall of China. 
As for cultural and political context, Demetrius I ruled over the Hellenistic kingdom that was heavily influenced by Greek culture, language, and administrative practices, partly from his own heritage. He established a new capital, or pardon me, not capital, but a new major city named after himself, Demetrius. So it's perhaps vanity, or perhaps he deserved it, or perhaps just the legacy of Alexander. Alexander named many cities after him. Alexandria was even the, one of the, the Greek Hellenistic name of one of the capitals of the Greek of Bactrian kingdom. So maybe it's not so vain to name a city after himself after the, Alexander the Great had done it so many times. His rule represented a synthesis of Greek and indigenous Central Asian and Indian cultures, with Greek likely serving as the language of administration and the elite. As we see in, for example, Gibbon's decline and the fall of the Roman Empire, the Rome Latin was the language of administration and the law, where Greek was the language of the arts. So sort of flipped in this sense, where Greek was the language of administration and perhaps the law. I don't know to what extent they had it codified or to what extent it was a legalist state, but nonetheless, it was the language of administration, whereas the other languages might have been maybe more focused on the arts or maybe local um, issues. As for Modu Shen Yu, led a nomadic confederation with a distinct steppe culture. His rule was characterized by the pragmatism and adaptability typical to steppe societies, which were shaped by nomadic lifestyles, but very many different cultures within. So both of them were pretty quite effective in accepting and being tolerant to other cultures, languages, and religions. As for legacy and impact, Demetrius I's reign left a lasting impact on the history of Greco-Bactrian kingdom, of the Greco-Bactrian kingdom, showcasing the potential for Hellenistic culture to influence and adapt to diverse regions. Modu Shan Yu's leadership was instrumental in the formation and consolidation of the Xiongnu Empire, which exerted a significant influence on the geopolitics of ancient East Asia, and perhaps even influencing future nomadic leaders such as Genghis Khan and others we shall cover. Thus, while Demetrius I and Modu Shen Yu came from different cultural and political backgrounds, they both demonstrated exceptional leadership skills and left a significant impact on the empires they ruled and established. Demetrius I's legacy is associated with the spread of the Hellenistic culture into Central, East, Central Asia and India, while Modu Shen Yu is remembered for centralizing and strengthening the Xiongnu Empire in the Eurasian steppes. So different regions, similar time period, both of them were founders, but founders in sort of different ways. We could say that Demetrius I was more like a Washington figure. He broke off, but he made, but he also contributed to, he wasn't maybe the only one who led to the establishment of the United States, but sort of his work was predominantly in Washington, George Washington's was predominantly in independence, but Demetrius sort of was like, a Demet Demetrius the first was kind of like a Was George Washington plus an Alexander Hamilton, we could say, for example, or maybe more like a James Madison, because he actually, James Madison became president, and Demetrius the first was a leader throughout. Whereas Modu Shen Yu was sort of more of one, more like a Genghis Khan figure many years before, who united peoples and posed a significant threat to ancient China. Um, Genghis Khan later period of China, but posed a significant threat to the Han Dynasty. But both of them were significant in that they ruled over large swaths of land, different peoples, different cultures, and different religions, and they were both great in both diplomacy and military strategy. So that is Demetrius I of the Greek King Bactrian Kingdom and Modu Shan Yu of the Zhang Nu Confederation. This is Ages of Empires, Cashcroft TV. My name is Kaylin Ashcroft. Thank you very much for your support, and I hope you continue to do so. Thank you very much.